laver cough, you laver queer. Never a dull's ma as a davis ray here. Mez, dain heb tabus, a gull as he dear. The old saying is a true saying. Never did good come of a tongue too long. But a man without a tongue has lost his land. We live in uh, Wimbledon. My parents have had a house in Porthilly for years and they came down here as kids so they got a place in Porthilly which is just around the cove and they've had it for years, yeah, 30 or so. You come here uh, Yeah, we're down here like every holiday um, because we just love the place. Um, because Dad's been here for ages and he loves sailing, water skiing um, and golf as well. We're down here like every holiday whenever we get the chance really. And, uh, do you have any Cornish blood as well? Um, <clears throat> no, nobody's <clears throat> nobody was born in Cornwall. They're from Gloucestershire, so not Cornwall, no. And um, we're we're making a film also about um, Cornish independence. Um, uh, Maybe in Kerner. Do you know about that? No, I don't. Sorry, no. Um, Kerner, what is that? That's uh, it's what was it called? Kerner's Cornwall and Cornish. Oh, really? Oh, right. No, I didn't know anything about that. No. Do you think Cornwall should be independent? Do you think it should have a devolved government? Oh, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I've always thought of it as part of England, so I don't really... Well, if the Cornish people yeah, want that... Yeah, if they that, want it, then yeah. Then they can have it. <laughs> I just, I'm not really fast. No. Well... Oh, how are you, Paul Hodge? Uh, Dresden Jif, me you, um, lab was in Colgy Kerno Sinostal, Mez, Dre Knowles, Ithel V, Barth. As you know, Cornwall is more beautiful than any other part of the UK. <laughs> uh, but seriously, um, you get a concentration of holiday homes around the coast. We have more coast than anywhere else in the UK, any other region in the UK. Therefore, the problem is worse in Cornwall. There's an over-reliance on tourism. Um, a bit of tourism is fine, um, but it's got completely out of control. We're a very unusual estate agency. We only work a very small marketplace. We're a niche agent. We work a five mile radius, uh, which is Rock, Damer Bay, Polesdale, and Port Isaac. Um, that area is, is very much a tourist destination, always has been. Uh, right. Right, so if we're looking at the, the, the housing stock that we've got here, a couple of properties here which you know, very expensive if you're looking at it from a local affordability level. That's a, a small terraced house which you'd expect a local family to live anywhere else in the countryside. Uh, this actually was built uh, as a second home scheme. It has got full residential permission on it, but at 425,000, you know, that is out of reach of any local person. Um, then second homes, we've got some beautiful second homes. Um, these are built as second homes and really, you know, you've got to remember that this is a very, very popular area just as Saint-Tropez is or Monaco. You know, this is a billionaire's area where they like to spend their money. We all aspire to making our millions and being able to spend our money freely. So this is a supply here uh, for that marketplace. 
This house, uh, uh, one of the Medros properties on the market for in excess of two million pounds. It's a beautiful New England house, um, you know, touching distance to the beach. Obviously unaffordable for anyone locally, um, but not designed for local occupation. This is designed for a certain type of marketplace, which is the second home marketplace. Um, to what extent do you think this is um, affecting the Cornish youth who are trying to buy houses in Cornwall? I mean, is it, is it similar all around Cornwall? Is this there, there are areas where it's more acute than other areas. Um, I would say I would be very depressed if I was uh, in that age category myself now. Um, you know, unfortunately, house prices are just ridiculously high. I don't think any first-time buyer can really step on the ladder without parental help. But what you've got to remember is this is not a Cornish problem. This is a country problem, and it is something that is countrywide. So what we need are new housing developments, 100% affordable. What we need is a cap put on holiday homes, maybe 5-10% per parish, so that you actually spread the problem around. There are some parishes in Cornwall, uh, especially on the Roseland, Gerlands for example, where the percentage of holiday homes um, actually reaches 75%. It's, it's acute in Cornwall and we've obviously got someone uh, to point a finger at, which is the second homeowner, because obviously they are taking housing stock away from local people. But in the problem we've got is we've got too few houses. Even if the second homeowners all went, we'd probably have too few houses um, and then we wouldn't have any jobs. Um, and of course, it's a catch-22. You need a job to be able to buy a house because you can't get a mortgage without a job. Um, but obviously if you have a job and then the mortgage is too big because the house price is too big, you're, you're stuck as well. So unfortunately house ownership is a big catch-22 and it always has been, to be honest. It's just more acute now than it ever has been. There's a level of young people trying to get on a property ladder that, um, because in this area they just can't afford to. I mean, wages in Cornwall are generally low and property is generally very, very high. Across the river, third most expensive place in the world to live. You know, it says it itself. But we still have to have tourism, whichever way you look at it. We still have to have tourism. I think holiday homes need to be taxed um, massively, um, maybe four or five times the normal community charge. Uh, basically, whatever the market will withstand. Um, the money raised should then go into affordable um, home schemes but specific to that area. The thing that upsets me the most is I do think that they should have to pay full council tax on second homes. I don't think they should get away with not paying it when there's so many people you know, not having it. They need, we need more houses, we need more council houses for like, the young people, more affordable housing. You know, we live in a beautiful place and there's, everyone else wants to live here as well, I suppose. So you know, I think there should be some concessions for local people. meat, potato, onion and turnip, which is basically chopped and mixed together, um, seasoned with salt and pepper, and we tend to add cottage cream to make the gravy for the pasties. Um, we slice it up, we'll chop it, dice it, and then we put it into a round piece of pastry and then we cook. <laughs> <It's really good. laughs> we'll just lay that down. Right. <laughs> is there anything special about your pasties from this shop? Yeah, um, it is my granny's recipe. Um, she's originally well, with an old Cornish family, um, and it's basically her recipe. We used to be milk cream, which is where the cream came from, <laughs> the leftovers. Sort of. what, and what do you feel about uh, tourists in Padstow? Tourists in Padstow, um, well, we wouldn't survive without them. Um, it's, it's a double edged sword in some respects. Um, Padso is a beautiful place, but we wouldn't have a business, and um, the local people wouldn't have jobs without the tourist industry. So, you know, we, we need it. <laughs> the whole thing about the property market as well is that that's that's one of the big issues. It's uh, the fact that we can't. These people say uh, homes for the Cornish. There are none. Uh, they're, they're, they're not affordable. There's no affordable housing. Yeah, in Padstow, certainly there's been there's a lot of second homes, a lot of holiday homes. But I've got to say, who sold them the houses in the first place? That's got to be said. People tend to sweep that under the counter. 
but it's Cornish people who sold the houses. Yeah, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. And, and again, it certainly does. Uh, I think areas are, are, are starting to address the thing, but there's no overnight miracle solution. It's going to take years. I think uh, Cornwall could survive, survive on tourism alone. What do you think? Uh, well, we pretty... We pretty much do, actually, because when you look at traditional things, uh, farming, I wouldn't say it's in decline, but farming has deteriorated over the years. Uh, a, le a lot less people are in it. People are sort of niche marketing in farming, producing specialised food, which is one way of, of making, you know, making a living and what have you. The fishing industry is high bound by regulations from Brussels anyway, and the common fisheries policy. And as a result, fishing has declined in this port. And a lot of ports along, along the coast of Cornwall. Government have cut us down on quotas on almost all species of wet fish, so we can't go netting or anything like that because it's just the quotas that they've allowed us won't allow us to fish the species we look for at the different seasons of the year. You know, we only get a few weeks at different species, and just in happening. Uh, tin mining, of course, is no more and never will be. So Cornwall's had to change, but tourism has been the major earner for the Cornish economy for several years now, and it's on the increase. We've got to present a good front for people to come. It's a very competitive industry, tourism. And yet, I, I, I think I'm fair in saying that uh, there was a survey last year that said the South West and Cornwall in particular, uh, particular are market leaders when it comes to tour tourism in England and Wales and Scotland. And we've got to make sure we keep that. And to do that, we've got to provide good facilities, good staff, good levels of service and good products. And as long as we do that, yeah, it's a valuable source of income to Cornwall. And it's no good the extremists started singling out people like Jeremy Oliver and, and Rick Stein. What for? They're providing the very money that actually gives some benefits in the corner. Of course we could do with a bit more. But like the Olympic, uh, tourism is the big thing. Cornwall's got to have tour tourism. There's no doubt about that. We have to have tourism. Our industry isn't that affected by it. Everything we catch is, is exported. Almost 99% you know, of our catch goes abroad. Well, that was a load of nonsense when they tried to ban the flying of the Cornish flag um, because it wasn't recognised as a national flag, which is typical because um, central government does very little to recognise Cornwall or things Cornish. Obviously, if you're born and bred in the county and your descendants go back over generations, as mine do, uh, I think there's no finer place to be. I'm, I must emphasise I'm very proud of my Cornish heritage. Cornish identity is very varied, to be quite honest. It's got many, many different attributes. It's a historic identity and it's a modern identity. It's about Cornish language and it's about surfing. Getting to, getting to understand their, their culture is a bit of a different thing. Um, and maybe it's because they're isolated. They are pretty isolated. I mean, they all talk about the Tamar Bridge. You know, take away the Tamar Bridge and, and, and they'll be, remain Cornwall. Well, I'm Hannah Eugenia Fallo, Hag at the Villemino Saberi Warnith Ganuic, right the Spletio in Eighth Hag in Christia in the Eighth Gans Pobble in Kerno. I think the, la yeah, the language is a mark of distinctiveness, and Cornwall has a very distinctive culture. Um, and people, I think, are more and more conscious that things have been lost, and therefore they're very keen to have part, have their local identity reinforced. For Cornwall, it's a particular mixture. Uh, we've seen a big revival in music and dance as well, traditional music and dance. We've seen a revival in the language. Um, we've seen traditions uh, either reaffirmed or resuscitated, whether it's festivals or traditions that, have, that may have died out or, or, ch or changed. Um, side by side with, with new traditions in terms of um, theatre, um, theatrical traditions, which are actually not that old, but they're still part of that mix, and the art tradition, which is all that mix of what makes up Cornwall, and what's made up Cornwall over the centuries. So I think people are very proud, uh, particularly in Cornwall, of where they come from. They're very proud of the cultural mix that we've got. Um, and learning the language and seeing the language around them is, is part of that. We lost our language once, so we're not going to lose it again. Um, so, like, Welsh for shop is shop. 
But Cornish for shop is Gwerthji. Yeah. Um, uh, Welsh for show is show. Um, but Cornish for show is disquithians. Yeah. You know, we we we, we do uh, telephone in Welsh is telephone. Telephone. Yeah. Um, in Cornish is pelgazer. And what does that mean, literally? Uh, far speaker, the same as the English. Well, maybe in Kerno is a Cornish nationalist party. We're a progressive party campaigning for greater devolution to Cornwall. What's your reaction to the, the recent separatist threats against the chefs? This, the CNLA threats, if you like. I mean, we're very, very angry because we're obviously working very hard through the democratic process. We're making good progress. We've got good election results this year. And then we've got a few misguided people making these threats, which is going to backfire. It's going to hurt the movement. It's going to hurt Cornwall's reputation. And I, I'm, I'm just really saddened by it. And I wish they'd stop what they're doing and do something more constructive, more positive, and through democratic means. What do you, what do you think about these people who are taking extreme action? Uh, there's no, they've got no excuse. They've got no justification for that, that sort of thing. What I think it is, it, and you can get extremists in any walk of life, but extremism in Cornwall has got no place. <clears throat> it's fine for them to say, oh yeah, they remember Anne Goff and the Cornish rebellions and what have you in the 14th to 15th centuries, I think. Uh, yeah, that, that happened. It also happened in a lot of other places, and it happens today throughout the world. But there's no justification for that sort of thing. In Cornwall, I don't care whether they call themselves Cornish or not. Uh, they're not. And they, quite honestly, the vast majority of Cornish people, who, as I've previously said, are, are proud of their heritage and proud to be Cornish and live in, I think they're horrified by these people. And it makes me feel quite ashamed to be Cornish because I don't want to be associated with any of these people. I say to them, you know, Cornwall's got to change. Cornwall's changing all the time. It's changed over the centuries. But we can still keep our heritage, still keep our traditions and change with it. But we've got to embrace change. And I say to them, get out and embrace change. If you feel so strongly, yes, do it through political means and ends, but get out, do something active. And I'm afraid that I feel that a lot of these people don't do that. Extremists slash flag flown to support troops. Could you just talk us through what happened there? Uh, what happened was um, this couple at Tresillian flew the English flag, the Cross of St George, at half mast. Um, allegedly for troops killed in Afghanistan and Iraq. But um, an extremist Cornish group came along, ripped it down, slashed it and put graffiti on their garden wall. So the local media, local media, i.e. people from the southwest, came in and, and said how terrible this actually was. But as was pointed out in a flood of letters the following week, you don't fly the English flag for troops killed in wherever. It's like saying an English life is more important than a Scottish life, a Welsh life, an Ulster life, or indeed a Cornish life. If you want to fly a flag at half-mast, it should be the Union flag. This is Cornwall. Would you go into Scotland and fly a an English flag? No. Would you fly an English flag in Scotland to actually say that English lives are an English life is worth more than a Scottish life? You know, w w what do these people expect? We all live in the UK, but this place is Cornwall. But as I said, the majority of them are, are, are nice people, very accepting, um, easy going, very laid back lifestyle. Um, and maybe that's why they, they're a bit anti the what do you say, influx of, of people from, from up country because they want to, re, want to just remain that way. There's lots of anecdotal evidence of um, people mainly from English cities moving to Cornwall to, as they say, escape the darkies. Um, and then you get this usual sort of racist banter. Um, what they fail to realise is that they are the foreigners and um, the English come to Cornwall in such numbers that it's far worse than any immigration. So I say to the English racists that come down here, um, 
just think of the immigration problem and then quadruple it and then you might start to feel a little bit like we do. Do you have any views on, on extremist action and militant action? Do you think it's, it's, it's justified? No, I never do actually. Um, because things can be negotiated around the table. And everyone has got an a, a point of, a, of view and an opinion on, on what should happen, and there's always a consensus. Personally, and I don't speak for any of the organisations that I belong to, I think if a few holiday homes were burnt down, it, wouldn't, it would be a victimless crime, as um, long as the firefighters weren't injured trying to put them out. The owners would get insurance payments, but it might be a wake-up call. The same thing happened in Wales, only in Cornwall we're so obsessed with the tourist industry that if someone were to burn down a few holiday homes, I'm sure the media would suppress it. So the situation in Cornwall has got so bad that militant action is called for. Um, something's got to happen. We've had decades of abuse um, from the London government, basically. So whatever government is in power in London, they will punish the Cornish and they will punish Cornwall and that's what's happening. When I mean, you talk about the politics, they, they talk about the Cornish political party or whatever they call themselves. I don't know. I've lived here four years. I still don't know what they're called. I've still never met one of them. So, you know, going on about it, why aren't they out there being spoken to and, and, and talking to people and, and, try, and trying to get a following and trying to get more support for themselves? But if, if they're going to sit in dungeons and discuss things amongst themselves or in caves from the old pirate days, who knows? Um, get out there and start talking to people because that's the only way they're going to get support. But we've never met any. We keep getting told they're around you and I ask about it and I say, well, get told, well, you must contact them. No, if they want to know, be known to who they are and what they do, they must contact the people. They must get out there and start talking to people, but they don't. And it's very secretive as to who they are, what they are, and what they stand for and so forth. And we still, to this day, don't actually know who they are. That's just one idiot, unfortunately. Being local is one idiot. You know, there is one person in his group, as he claims. Nonsense. <laughs> I'm still waiting to see whether they're going to come out and tell us what they, as the Cornish, see for Cornwall and what their plans are for Cornwall. Because we don't see anything like that. And if, if there's some people who are going to say, oh, but there are plans, well, why aren't they telling the people? Why is it not made public knowledge as to what the Cornish want for Cornwall?